The Florida Panthers are still yet another day without naming their head coach. We discuss which one of the coaching candidates that I'm starting to warm up to of who could be the possible next head coach of the Panthers. We continue our player grade series here on the podcast, and we also talk about last night's NHL player awards. We're going to talk about that all with Jacob Winans here on the Wednesday edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. Your Locked On Panthers, your daily podcast on the Florida Panthers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into this Wednesday, June 22nd edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. We're your team every day. Thank you for making the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast your first listen of the day. I'm Armando Velez from PantherParkway.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at MondoMan12. Follow the show account on Twitter at LO underscore FLA Panthers. And thank you for making the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast your first listen of the day. Don't forget to also subscribe to Locked On NHL and the Crosscheck NHL show with Andrew Berkshire and Mary Clark. They'll be covering all the postseason activities around the National Hockey League. So, Florida Panther fans, uh, we have a little bit to discuss uh, when it comes to the continued coaching search uh, for the Panthers and who's going to be the guy coaching this team. And of course, like we said at the top, we'll be talking about player grades later on in the show. And, of course, the NHL awards show uh, going on in between uh, game two, game three and four. But it's Wednesday. But it's <laughs> So that means it's a Wine and Wednesday edition of the Lockdown Florida Panthers podcast. And let me bring in my guest of the show, typical Wednesday here on the podcast, Jacob Winans. Welcome back to the show on this Wine and Wednesday edition. Thank you for having me. Always happy to be here. Absolutely, man. And, you know, when, when, you know, you and I had a lot, a lengthy discussion. I said it publicly on the podcast uh, yesterday, talking about how we had an extensive conversation really about really the state of the Panthers, even off, off camera and, you know, without the microphones and everything. And let, let's also talk about something that Frank, shared in our group chat about the a, a coach that I'm starting to warm up to the idea of possibly being the next head coach of the Panthers. And it the 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 coach the coach is someone I've already talked about earlier in the week. And that one that is Paul Maurice, a uh, former coach of the uh, Winnipeg Jets. Uh, I spoke about what his resume was a few days ago. But then Frank shared that uh shared that video of his press conference when he officially resigned from the position. I remember at the time when they were just providing just quotes from the press conference, but there you can't get as much context from tweets as you as you do when you actually watch the video. So when when I asked Frank to link that press conference, I actually listened to the whole thing. And honestly, the honesty and the maturity of a coach that he has, of course, been there, done that, it's really, really respectable. And I and I and I think that when you know, when you've been there for, been a coach for a while and know when it's your time to go, uh, I, I think that's a sign of a coach that could possibly get a little refreshed because there's, there's could possibly be burnout um, a little bit. And that's okay. That happens in every profession. I agree. Um, before we even dive into all the hockey, the hockey side of this, um, just Paul Maurice as a, as a human being, as a, as a man, I think what he did with Winnipeg was, was pretty admirable. Um, he felt like he could no longer help that team uh, to be as successful as they could be. Uh, he felt like his voice had gone kind of stale in the locker room and, and his, his system. Uh, I feel like he felt like he couldn't put a hundred percent into that team anymore and, and they weren't getting a hundred percent out. So it, it takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of courage to, to step down uh, from a position like that. Um, I'm sure he took a lot of heat for it at, at times, but, uh, it shows that he's a guy who's willing to do whatever it takes for his team. And, and he really cares about the, their success on and off the ice, even if it means that he needed to 
to show himself the door. So I have a lot of respect for how he how he handled um, the, the situation there in Winnipeg. Uh, and that's and that's just the off the ice stuff. I'm sure we're going to get into the on the ice uh, product when it comes to his coaching. But as off the ice, I think he's a really respectable guy. And if he does happen to come to Florida, I think uh, maybe this could be the team to rejuvenate him and, and uh, have him feeling fresh, like you said, about coaching again. You think about the mental, once again, we think about the mental aspect of it where he spoke a little bit in that press conference about how when the lockout was, was going on, I think, I think he was, I, he didn't say specifically which lockout it was. I, I, I'm assuming he's going to talk, he was talking about the most recent one in 2012 that he was talking about that he didn't really look forward to coming to the rink. And that when you are not looking forward to come to the rink, when this is your job, um, there's kind of like, and that that could wave a little bit of red flags, of course, but as well as when, of course, everyone has their own styles of like whenever it comes to uh, personality types. I, I encourage everyone to look up um, the Myers Briggs uh, personality types and how whenever you're on the grind, being away from your family every day and traveling, not getting that time of stillness book recommendation for everyone by the way stillness is the key by ryan holiday uh the fact that he's he has been unable to be in stillness as well from from the grind that comes with being a coach and of course maybe if we're talking five years um in, in his first five years and not taking a little break maybe maybe there'll be more criticism but he's been doing this for more than more than a decade two decades plus so again it's a good reset. It was, it's actually a good reset for him. And I think that he could e- become even better from it. I agree 100%. Um, I think a lot of times people who are in a profession like coaching, um, I, I think it, it helps a lot. Uh, some guys maybe aren't ready to retire, but maybe they are ready to reset and they need that time off uh, before jumping back into the, into the, like you said, the grind of being an NHL head coach. Um, it's, it's really an everyday task. There's so much travel involved, and um, it, it takes a lot out of someone. I, I would, I would be, I would be certain of that. So, um, yeah, maybe taking that time off really helped him reset. And also from a hockey side of things, taking some time off and being able to watch the game, be a spectator, and not have your hand, uh, your hands in the outcome of the games, and just watching and and learning. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for that. So uh, maybe this time off, he was able to watch some hockey. He was able to fall in love with the game again. And, and maybe he learned something in, in that time that he can bring back to, to his future coaching career should he decide to, to step back into the ring. He, he will definitely have a ton of suitors. And if, if the Panthers happen to be one of them, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for him. Mm-hmm. And, and, and like I said on Monday, this is a guy who's made three conference finals. He, he made a Stanley Cup final in 2002, uh, 775, uh, 681. 99 ties because he coached in the area where their ties were a thing and 130 overtime losses. So the record's there. The sample size is big enough. So uh, again, um, it's a, I think, I don't know. (laughs) It's funny because like I said, like Elliot Freeman has reported, he doesn't know whether the Florida Panthers are going to go with a assistant to Brunette. And then if Brunette flops, they're going to promote him. Do you think Paul Maurice would, take an assistant job i'm gonna i'm gonna be on the side of no if i think if he's gonna return it's it's gonna be him being the head guy yeah it it could set up a really interesting dynamic um brunette i I really do think the panthers want to retain him whether that's head coach or uh this final year on his contract as assistant coach now whether they decide to make him head coach and have a a very experienced guy as his assistant i don't know if that's paul maurice i think maurice is is uh just far too decorated as a head coach I agree. Um, for, for him to take an assistant role to a guy who honestly no no disrespect to Andrew Burnett but he is a, a rookie head coach as of right now so mm-hmm. um, I, I'm not sure Paul Maurice would take that but then again if he doesn't want to these are conversations that you have to have with him because if, if Paul Maurice doesn't want to jump into the the intense uh, responsibility and daily grind of being a head coach, maybe he'd like a lesser responsibility as, as an assistant coach. So it's something you at least ask, but personally, I think if he's coming back, he's coming back as a head coach. And, I agree. Um, and it, it'll, it would be interesting to see if uh, Burnett would, would return to an assistant role 
and 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 coach under Paul Maurice. And another thing that we didn't even discuss as far as this is concerned is if Paul Maurice does decide to to coach, the Panthers hire him. Maybe he he realizes that he does need to retire, and he's not he's just not feeling it. And it's you know maybe he he re, he enjoyed his time off and would like to get back to it, and and decides you know this isn't for me. Burnett would be on staff again as as an assistant coach, and I'd feel comfortable handing over that head coach role to him whenever the time may come. So it, it I could see it working out in a lot of different ways, and um, I, I, I I'm not opposed to Paul Maurice joining the staff at all, in whatever capacity it may be. Mm. And it, and if the and like I, and if Paul Maurice decides not to coach this year as well, if he decides not to take anything if offered, respect to him as well because he might it. it he is the ultimate guy who decides whether he wants to do this or not, because there's going to be someone who who's going to say, Hey, we want you to be that guy. And if he needs even more of a reset, I, I, I don't, I don't know what his mental health looks like and I'm not going to speculate on what it, what it, what it is. But if he personally feels like he needs that reset, who am I to tell him, who am I to tell him? No, who are we to tell him? No, as well. So that that's gonna that's also something that 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 factors in. And like you said, like you said with Brunette, uh, if if uh, Paul Maurice decides to retire, if he says he's not up for the mental grind of it, and he's ready to step in as the interim again, this is an opportunity for Brunette to be more prepared this time around as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I really think if the Panthers go the the route of getting a, a veteran coach who's been been in the league forever, I, I felt like when when Joel Quenzel was the coach, Andrew Burnett was kind of being developed into the future the future replacement. Um, I felt like the job would be his when Q did decide to step down, whenever that would be. It obviously came earlier than expected, but I see no reason why a veteran coach couldn't come in and we continue that trend. I think if it's Paul Maurice, if it happened to be someone like Barry Trotz, um, any of these uh, longtime veteran coaches who are kind of near the end of, ending uh, portion of their career, Brunette could, stu- could be the understudy for another year, two years, and, and eventually that head coaching role could become his. And I, I really, I think Paul Maurice is a good candidate for that. Mm. Let's also consider that Andrew Burnett will probably get interviews elsewhere um, right. in, in, in different, in di- like next, as soon as next year, now that he's had that experience. So let's also consider that there's also a possibility that the, that Andrew Burnett could be gone, even if they retain him as an assistant and getting interviews somewhere, because you, who, who are we to tell Andrew Burnett? No, no, don't go. Don't stay with, stay with the Panthers. Don't, don't go for an um, head coaching opportunity el- elsewhere. Who, who, no, it's not going to happen. Uh, so for 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 that sense, but uh, let's actually uh, let's actually transition over to the next segment where we're going to continue our uh, player grade series uh, for the Florida Panthers. We've gone, uh, we've done four players now. We're going to discuss uh, the next player in our player uh, grade series. But first, we're going to tell you all about Rock Auto. And with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts under a computer? Choose only the brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30 50 and 100% more for the same part at a chain store or car dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Rock Auto's prices are reliably low for every customer. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts for your car or truck. Right locked in, on in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So you know we sent you. Amazing selection. Reliably low prices. All the parts your car will ever need. Rockauto.com. Second segment here on the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. And thank you once again for making the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast your first listen of the day. So we're, we're continuing our player grade series uh, for the Panthers on what they uh, have done uh, this season. And today's player that we are going to discuss is Carter Verhage. Uh, of course, uh, top line winger uh, for, for the Panthers. Of course, when you're playing with Barkov and whether it's a mix of Giroux or Anthony Duclair, the possession numbers are going to work in your favor. Of course, uh, Carver Hagee doesn't always get on the scoreboard all the time, but as far as even strength, Carver Hagee is one of the best on, on this team. 
and how he's able to drive play and able to uh, set up other teammates for Barkov to possibly take over uh, the games as well. And sometimes when defenders draw so much towards Barkov, Carver Hage is getting his opportunity. And of course, we talked about this many times on the show. One man's trash is another person's treasure. And the Panthers getting him with Tampa not qualifying him an offer. And then this is the best part, Jacob. The fact that Bill Zito signed Verhage to an extension a year before he was going to become an RFA and a really great value signing that he's he has some term. So we come go into this summer more relaxed when it comes to a big piece on, on, on in the top six. Of course, there's still other things to to solve when it comes to the cap situation via trades. But of course, Verhage is definitely one that we don't need to worry about now that that is out of the way. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about with Verhage is uh, what you just mentioned there with, with Bill Zito. Um, his, him signing Verhage to a contract with, with term and a, a higher cap hit was seen as a risk. Um, Verhage had a, yes. a breakout season, um, 18 goals, 18 assists in 43 games. And that was kind of like, okay, we're going to see if he's going to continue this or if that was just the one-off. Zito trusted in him, um, really, really invested in him and believed that he would do it again. And he definitely improved in his second year with the Panthers. So um, huge credit to Zito for, for taking a chance on a guy that he handpicked and it paying off. So I want to obviously give Zito his credit for that. Um, Verhege for me this year, I'm going to give him a solid... I'm going to go A- minus for Verhege this year. Um, I, I think his 24 goals was fantastic. Um, anytime you see a guy hit that that 20-goal threshold, it's, that's that's kind of the, the bar for someone who makes his term and gets his top six ice time. You want, you want over 20 goals, um, 31 assists, 55 points in total. Very respectable numbers. Um, and, and keep in mind, Verhege split up and down the lineup and also played uh, six weeks during the year without Barkov at the centerman. So... Um, his production arguably would have been even higher had Barkov been healthy that entire time. Um, he, he's kind of like a fixer for me. Any, anytime he's on a line, that line seems to get better. So I, I really like Verhage's game. A um, couple things that I'd like to see a little bit of improvement on. Um, I'd like to see him shoot more. I, I feel like he, I feel like he could get his shot total, his shot total up closer to that 200 mark for the year. Um, I'd like to see him shoot more. He, I think he hovered around 160 in shots this season. I'd like to see him get to 200. Um, I think he, I'd also like to see him tone down the penalty minutes a bit because um, he, he doesn't get them with, with fighting. He doesn't get them with uh, the typical like tough guy stuff. It's usually stick infractions and things like that. So I, I'd like to see him tone down the penalty minutes a, a little bit, uh, stay out of the box. But um, we, we definitely can't talk about Carter Verhage without, without mentioning his fantastic playoff performance the, the first round against Washington um, really put the team on his back and that game five was 100% the best game of hockey he's ever played in his life so I, yeah massive credit to him for how he played against Washington um, went ice cold against Tampa at, as did everyone so mm-hmm. I'm not going to hold that against him too much and he was playing injured which was well known he was a game time decision most of that series but Man, he was he was absolutely spectacular. He, he had a very special series against Washington and was an, an early Conn Smythe um, favorite. So uh, A- minus for Verhage this season. Mm-hmm. Like like you said, um, his point production could have been a lot better had Barkoff not missed time. I mean, you think about when the amount of games uh, Barkoff missed in the 56 uh, game uh, season, uh, six games um, in that in that season and of course points per game uh for Verhage was a lot higher in 2021 than it was in 2022 but of course now that we have a full season sample size for uh Verhage at least the uh, and and any when you have a 20 goal uh, score on your team that's value no matter what um of course of course like you said we want to see Carver Hage shoot more uh the exact shots for uh, Carver Hage on the season is 167 average ice time is 1602 uh for for Carver Hage as well doesn't spend too much time on the power play. Average is about uh, one minute uh, of, of power play time on ice. Of course, uh, we expect him to get a little bit of a of an increase when it comes to when it comes to next offseason, depending on who stays, who goes, 
And of course, uh, possession numbers. Uh, it's um, the Corsi is over sixty percent with uh, with uh, Carver Hagee uh, in all in all situations. So that's a, that's a big plus for uh, for Hagee. And of course, uh, when you're when you're playing with Barkoff, he's going to make your game a, a lot better. Of course. Point point production as far as Verhage is in the end all be haul on his performance as well, but definitely if we see definitely those two hundred shots, we could very well easily see a thirty goal score uh, next year at at four point one six million too, and and that's just an incredible value for what Bill Zito is uh, put there. So my grade. Um, these are mostly regular season anal- uh, analysis when it comes to Verhage's game, uh, but his playoff performance, him taking over, but uh, of course, stretch a little bit of stretches where he went cold. I'm going to give him a solid B plus uh, for what what he's done this season. Yeah, I, I think that's a really respectable grade for him. Um, a, a couple of things I want to point out when evaluating Verhage. Um, one one underrated stat that I, that I noticed as we were. Uh, discussing uh he's a winger obviously but uh at at times when when a player gets tossed from the the face off uh Verhage will step in and take those face off he actually went surprisingly outrageous in the face off circle this year with a 65 percent win percentage i'm not sure what the sample size is on that as far as actual face off taken but 65 percent is pretty uh pretty pretty up there so that's another thing he's a, a a good utility guy he can play in all situations but um if my math is correct He's got, all right, so 24 goals last year, or this season, 18 goals the year before that. That's somewhere around, um, off the top of my head, 42, um, somewhere around that that area. He has one power play goal as a Panther. He, he mm-hmm. does everything at even strength, uh, and that is that is extremely valuable. He, he's a, a five-on-five monster. Um, he, he, he doesn't... He doesn't grub points on the power play he, he's doing it at even strength only one of his goals as a, as a florida panther came on a power play so that's that's another thing to keep in mind and he's he's plus 48 since he came to florida so do you remember which game he got the power play goal i remember oh that is unforgettable that was dallas if i'm not mistaken yes. and he got an even strength a power play and a shorthanded for yep, a hat trick. then for a hat trick. That was that. That was. Uh, I don't know if that was the same weekend that uh, Aaron Ekblad uh, injured his uh, leg in that, uh, but it was one of those uh, two game trips in Dallas last season, and that was just a. That's just a game you definitely couldn't forget because it, when he had it in all situations, like this doesn't happen for Verhage. He's he's he only does it on on even strength. So the fact that he got all three of them uh, in that one, that was just very a very memorable game for Carter Verhage. So. B plus uh, for me, A minus for uh, Jacob Winans here. Uh, so that's going to wrap up for uh, this uh, this uh, player grade uh, th- this player grade for for this edition of the Lockdown Florida Panthers podcast. In the next segment, we are going to uh, discuss the NHL awards that were last night uh, on the for. Uh, last night uh in tampa bay uh hosted by keenan thompson we're going to discuss that more in the next segment but first we're going to tell you all about bet online and betonline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info find all the latest sports developments league reviews and news including this year's nhl playoffs and major league baseball BetOnline is your continuous source for all your sports wagering information including live betting esports and scores and BetOnline.net it remains your best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to lo- learn more about the trends and action. BetOnline, where the game starts. Third and final segment here on the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. I'm Armando Velez. I got Jacob Winans here on this Winans Wednesday edition of the show so a little bit of uh context for everyone listening uh you guys will be listening to this on june 22nd we are recording this right before the nhl awards uh have started hosted by keenan thompson uh and we're recording it once again we're recording this uh right right before but when it comes to the awards i i don't know how much of a debate there are in between in between who's going to win what. So let's discuss some of the obvious ones that there's probably no debate of. Let's start with the Vesna. 
We agree. Igor Sisterkin, right? Definitely, one hundred percent. And um, I, I'm not sure if you, I'm not sure if you have your alerts going or not. But actually, as we're recording this, Shesterkin did just now win the Vesna Trophy. So I'm not sure if we can count that as a prediction. But um, I'll, yeah, that, that Shesterkin ran away with it this year. Uh, yeah, he, he was unbelievable. Um, and he's he's obviously going to be one of the the top top tier goalies for years to come. Um, it, it's really him and Vasilevsky and then everyone else. So, uh, unbelievable season from Shesterkin. His numbers were just ridiculous. And, uh, he, he backed it up in the playoffs as well. Um, happy we're not in the Metro division. He's not a guy I'd like to see too many times, but, uh, he's, he's spectacular. And, um, you know, if, if the world cup of hockey is, is coming back, who do you start if you're Russia? Because you have Shesterkin and Vasilevsky as your two goalies and one of them is going to have to sit. So that that's going to be something something to see if if the World Cup of Hockey does make its return. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sorokin's another uh, one as well yeah. that you got to think about. And I just got the notification as well, so I'm actually going to put my phone and flip it the other way, so I'm not uh, surprised. But I will. By any I, yeah, I, I'm going to do the same. We're gonna we're gonna go blind. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about uh, another pro possibly obvious one: the Calder. Um, voted by the P PHWA. By the way, uh, the GMs are the ones that vote for the Vesna. So Calder, uh, I think we both agree that more it's, it's going to be more cider. Not much of a debate there. Yeah, I uh, know we're going to piss off a lot of Toronto fans who are still uh, thumping as hard as they can for, for Michael Bunting. Uh, no disrespect to Bunting. Uh, I know he's a lot older than the other rookies. Barely mm -hmm. made it in, the, in as the, the rookie criteria. And I love his story. Um, I love what he's overcome and how he's gotten to this point. But it's Mo Sider. Uh, and Mo Sider was absolutely fantastic. Um, he's a guy who scares me as a defenseman for the next 10 to 15 years with the Red Wings uh, in our division. Um, mm -hmm. he, he's terrifying. Uh, the dude can skate. He can shoot. Uh, his point production is there on a really bad team. He defends, and, and he's just an absolute tank. I don't even think he's at his... He's, he's probably good. not at his yeah. He's probably not at his his uh, maximum uh, playing weight that he's going to end up spending most of his career at. But man, his his reverse hit, um, the, the way he just he honestly doesn't he, he's immovable. No one can push him off the puck. He throws people around. Um, it, yeah, it's hard to argue with him. He is a true number one uh, number one defenseman, and I don't see I don't see anyone beating him for this for this trophy and I, I do see Norris uh, Norris trophies in his future. Absolutely. I, that guy is special. Mm -hmm. And I thought that someone like uh, Ben Sherratt was huge whenever I, when I walked by him, uh, when I went down for round one and uh, let's, uh, let's just look at the height for and wait for more insider six, four, 196 pounds. Maybe that was last year when he was first uh, coming onto the league. So who knows what the update on his weight um, is now, and he's going to build up some muscle. Uh, that's for sure. And we, of course, there's going to be a lot of criticisms year in and year out about the Calder Trophy on eligibility. I mean, Nadelkovich was apparently still eligible this year. Uh, Artemi Panarin, uh, there was another criticism for him when he won the Calder. Kirill Kaprizov just last year. That's all. I, I just, I just come to realize that it's going to be forever a thing when it comes to Calder and the when it comes to the 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 criteria of what what is a real Calder Trophy winner and what's not. Let's uh let's go to let this is gonna get a little harder now. Um Hart Trophy. Man, Connor McDavid's crazy crazy enough. He had the most uh, he had the most points in his career winning the Art Ross trophy. But I think that the fact the way that Austin Matthews has exploded in his career, um scoring over 60 goals. I think voter fatigue is going to, regardless of the point production that Connor McDavid had. I know Wayne Gretzky didn't have much of voter fatigue during his days. But I think voter fatigue is gonna is gonna happen for Connor McDavid, and I think it's gonna be Austin Matthews' uh, heart trophy. Yeah, um, I, I agree as well here. Um, so I'm gonna actually take a look at McDavid's stats real quick because it, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, his I, I know he had I know he had the most of his career, but um, 123 points. Yeah, that, that's he, he's a 44 goal scorer this season, 79 assists. So he's he's among the elites in goal scoring and assists, 123 points. I think in any normal season that gets you a guaranteed 
uh, Hart Trophy. I don't think anyone can argue with that. I think he's a guaranteed Hart Trophy any other season. But Austin Matthews, as much as I'd like to see, as much as I I don't like to see Toronto winning uh, any hardware, it's, it's going to go to Austin Matthews. Um, 60 goals in 73 games is is unheard of. Um, his, his assist numbers came around this year a, a lot. It was 46 assists, 106 points. Um, but the thing that impressed me most outside of the 60 goals is his two-way game. Uh, I think mm-hmm. he really, I think he really developed uh, on the defensive side of the puck. Uh, he started to use his body more. He started to, to generate a lot of takeaways, and and he's he's become a really dominant two-way center. Um, so I'm I'm gonna say it's Austin Matthews, and I don't I don't know how you can follow up a 60 goal season. This may be this may be the peak of his career, but <laughs> 60 goals is is um that's just remarkable so i'm gonna say austin matthews takes it Mm -hmm. and uh 13 more than his uh second best uh season and of course uh missing some time uh uh, nine games one of them one of them was a two-game suspension as well he still led the league in in goal goals um also uh his career high in assists by um beat up his previous career high by 10 and of course that marner and matthews line got going a little bit during uh the playoffs mitch marner uh he um ended his uh playoff goal drought as well and toronto didn't lose in your typical toronto fashion collapse they were actually hanging on with the tampa bay lightning of that they lost, but of course they 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 made it a, a challenge for Tampa Bay, and Austin Matthews had a lot to do with it. Mostly, mostly when it comes to the Toronto Maple Leafs and who they might or might not move, the the conversation is not around Austin Matthews or Mitch Marner. It's mostly around John Tavares. That's really what the conversation really is around there. But let's go to the next one, the Ted Lindsay Award. This one is voted by the NHLPA. And I think that the I think that the NHLPA let, let's let's also describe what the Ted Lindsay Award uh, ver, differentiate Ted Lindsay versus Hart. Uh, when you think about Hart, you think MVP, and when Tim um, Ted Lindsay is the most outstanding player. And I think because McDavid is likely not to win the Hart, I think that the Ted Lindsay is going to go to McDavid this time for this one. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Um, think of the the Ted Lindsay as kind of like the People's Champion Award. Um, I, if if the heart is going to Matthews, I think the the players all generally know that Matthews is going to win the heart. So I think I think the players are going to vote this for Connor McDavid. It's hard to argue um, against that with his point production. Um, Probably the best, se- definitely the best season the Oilers have had as far as postseason success uh, under um, McDavid's time there. So I think, I think that Ted Lindsay is going to go to McDavid, and I think he's going to collect quite a few more of those in his career because what he did this season was was nothing short of incredible. Uh, and and it's it's kind of it's kind of unfair what what the Oilers have over there with with McDavid and Drysaitel. It's that is a, a hell of a one-two punch. Yeah, and. Uh... And McDavid has already uh, won the Ted Lindsay uh, three times in his uh, career. Uh, so yeah. he, he's likely going to uh, get another one. Uh, the finalists are him, uh, Roman Yossi, and Austin Matthews. So likely going to win it uh, for the fourth time. Th- this one, this last one, might be a little bit more difficult when it comes to who w- could win the Norris Trophy for best defenseman. And I was just looking up every single I, – I looked up power play. I looked up even strength when it comes to the – I don't think Victor Hedman's going to win it. I think it's between no. Kael McCarr and Roman Yossi. And I looked at what Roman Yossi has been able to do even strength. Of course, it's a lot easier to score when you're on the power play, but that's nothing against Kael McCarr. Um, but, of course, Kael McCarr is so young. I mean, I think he's 23 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but – what Roman Yossi is also, but Kel McCarr, I looked up how he has is defensively even strength and on the penalty kill, he gives up less goals per sixty minutes than Roman Yossi. So defensively, according according this is according to Hockey Reference, he is the he is a better defensive defenseman. But if if history shows what this this award is voted on, this is a, a award that's historically 
awarded for the best offensive defenseman, even though we think that the best defensive defenseman should have their own award. So if I'm going with what the history shows as offensive defensemen, look, let's look at their even strength numbers, uh, even strength points. Uh, Ro- Yossi has 59 points at even strength, uh, 12 goals, 47 assists. Kel McCarr, if my math is correct, um, 52, 52. So, so, uh, so 59 to 52 um, for Yossi power play even even um for McCarr nine power play goals to Yossi's 11 and one more assist than Kale McCarr so if we're going with the trend of offensive defensemen I think the I think the numbers back up more uh Roman Yossi as the guy who's going to win a Norris trophy um win the Norris trophy he's already won one before in his career this is, is likely going to be looking like his second yeah, this one is it's kind of splitting hairs. What what these two guys were able to do this season, it, it's absolutely insane. Um, I think Victor Hedman is fantastic, and it, it, he's been a dominant defenseman for the better part of a decade. Uh, don't get me wrong there, but I think he he's honestly the third wheel in this discussion, which is crazy to think about. But um, mm-hmm. uh, the thing that that, that has Makar um, that makes it so difficult to vote against Makar is his uh, his goal total. Um, 28 goals for a defenseman is is really really uh, absurdly high. Um, it, it's hard to vote against that 86 points, but I think there's a couple things that are going to sway this to Roman Yossi. One, Yossi did what he did with a much a much less competitive team. Yes. Um, Kale McCarr did this on a loaded Colorado team. Nothing nothing against Colorado because McCarr is, is kind of the engine of that team outside of McKinnon. So they're loaded because of McCarr to an extent. But Roman Yossi is head and shoulders above everyone else on his team except maybe Philip Forsberg. So um, it, for, for Yossi, he, he put a team on his back where McCarr was kind of a, a key part of, some, of a team that was already a wagon. Um, so I, I think Yossi takes it. I really do. And I think another thing that, that gives this uh, – Yossi more more of a chance here is the fact that he's older. Um, everyone voting on this award knows he's older. They know Makar is going to get several, several, several more chances at this award. Mm-hmm. Um, he, there's no doubt Makar is going to win win the Norris trophies in his career. So I, think, I agree. I, I think you give. I think this goes to to Roman Yossi, and Makar will be right back here next year, and the year after that, and the year after that. Absolutely. He- the the way the just watching him skate even before shooting the puck or passing just watching him skate is just incredible to watch just that part of his game and one thing that will be also announced um at the nhl awards is the finalist for the jim gregory award um i'm thinking it's going if i had to guess who the finalists are going to be i think it's going to be bill zito i think it's going to be uh I think it's going to be uh, Jared Bednar uh, of the Colorado Avalanche, and here here's another here's another one uh, the the GM of the of the Calgary Flames. I think that's going to be an- another one uh, for sure uh, that that has helped. Even though uh, his name um, Brad T- Treliving, um, even though the Calgary Flames uh, didn't get through the second round. I, I think that the way they were building that team, uh, and and of course Daryl Sutter, he just won the Jack Adams. I think that there's also a chance for those uh, finalists to be there. But also an honorable mention, uh, Julian Brisebois as well. Of course, trading for Brandon Hagel, giving up two first round picks for him. So it could be one of those four uh, as well. So the, so what about you? Yeah. So I, I know um, for Colorado, Joe Sakic. I, I think he's the um, He's definitely going to get consideration. Um, did I say I think, Jer- did I say Jared Bednar? I meant to say Joe Sackage. My bad. I, I think you. I think you might have said Bednar. Oopsie. But, um, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely Sackage. Um, I, I think. I think he's going to get heavy consideration. But. But to be honest, I think obviously you cannot say Zito is not a finalist, and I, I really think it's Zito's award to 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 take home this year. Um, he he really built this team uh, in a matter of two off seasons and he, he came in, hit the ground running. I felt like he should have won it last year. Uh, I, I felt strongly that it should have been his award last year. I don't think they pass over him again. So um, those two are my top two. I think Calgary 
Uh, Trey Living did a great job. Um, a, a few trades that, that really sparked his team. You get Tyler to Foley to Calgary. That was a big one. Um, and then he also really put um, some some defensemen in a, a better position to succeed. You think of Zadorov and Goodbranson became a really solid shutdown pair um, after Calgary gives them a chance. Um, so I, I think there's there's a handful of, of guys that you can point to on Calgary's roster that are like, hey, this is a great move by their GM. Um, but for me, it's 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 Sakic and and Zito ahead of the rest for sure. Mm-hmm. And for living, also used that asset from the Bennett trade, uh, Emil Hyman, uh, to to send to Montreal in exchange for uh, Toffoli. So. That's a that's a GM who's also uh, used an asset from one trade to right. get someone else as well. Of and course, you know, and, and um, sorry to cut you off there, but I wanted to throw in another thing about uh, Colorado with with uh, Sackick, and uh, he he's definitely their best player ever. But also the fact yes. that he's a, an elite GM for them is crazy. But uh, I saw an interview actually last night with Nathan McKinnon uh, where he was heavily questioning. Um, what what Saki was doing when drafting Kale McCarr. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I, I, you may have seen that, that was, too. I sent it to you. Yeah. yeah, I was the one who sent it to you, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, might, I may have seen it on your story, but McKinnon uh, talking about um, how they drafted McCarr out of the Alberta uh, Junior Hockey League, the AJHL. And he's like, who is this guy? These guys are terrible. They're they're awful. What what are we doing here? And it happens to be Kale McCarr who's become a, 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 one of the top two defensemen in hockey. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, even Nathan McKinnon didn't know what his GM was doing, but it just shows how, how great his scouting is and his decision-making. So if he gets the award, um, can't argue with it. He's a, he's a fantastic hockey mind on the ice in the, in the um, GM chair. He's, he's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, like you said, greatest player to, uh, to, to play under the Colorado Avalanche, uh, multiple Stanley Cup champion as, as well um so uh, uh panther fans from the ni- 96 uh season definitely uh know uh, really about uh joe sackage they got to really experience uh that unfortunately that part of him him and uh Pat- patrick wall and the fact that he's coming back to his uh his team that he played for just like steve eiserman with the red wings uh we're we're, we're definitely uh seeing that and though definitely uh the Josh Manson trade for Joe Sackage. That's a great trade. And we see how much, how much he drives play. He, how much he's not afraid to hit neither Josh Manson as well. So definitely a, a valuable piece for the Colorado avalanche as uh, right now they're uh, leading to one heading into game four um, of the Stanley cup final. Um, one more thing before we get out of here, um, let's talk about uh, predictions for game four. We both predicted that Tampa would win game three. Um, I think Colorado wins game four. I think they learn from their mistakes um, from uh, like, and like we talked about, they controlled a lot of the possession, but just a little a few breakdowns here and there. But I do think they win game four and uh, have an opportunity to win the cup at home in game five. I agree. I think Colorado takes it in game four. I think they started, they started uh, better in Tampa than, than the lightning did. It took the lightning a while to get going. Um, they really were, were, completely on the ropes uh, they gave up the first goal and then they also had one that was that was called off for offside I think if that goal stands it's a whole different story so mm-hmm. um, I think Colorado has been the best team in the in the playoffs by far uh, their record is absurd and another thing that I think Tampa has going has uh, negatively impacting them is one Braden Point is definitely not okay mm-hmm. Uh, he hasn't looked good since he came back from his injury. And like we said yesterday off camera, we can't say he was rushed. I just think it's an injury that it's not going to get better until he has the full off season to, to let that heal. So um, unfortunate for him, but they've been able to to fill that hole. Now it gets more difficult because Nick Paul was clearly injured yesterday, finished the game. He gutted it out. We'll see what he looks like tomorrow. Kucherov or, as well. Later today and Nikita Kucherov. Um, he, he suffered a, a, kind of ugly looking injury himself. And they're saying that he's a game time decision, but they expect him to play Corey Perry. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll see what these, these guys are all banged up. We're going to see what, what they look like just because they're playing doesn't mean they're themselves. So mm-hmm. I, I think Colorado is, is poised to take advantage of that. And um, we'll see if, if Nazem Kadri gets in a game here soon too. So I think everything favors Colorado right now. And the only only weakness I could see is maybe Kemper is a little shaken after the game he had, but even if he is 
Frantos is more than capable. So the only mm-hmm. way I could see Tampa winning tomorrow is if Vassy steals a game. Mm-hmm. Um, de- definitely possible. It's Vassy we're talking about, but I, I really think Colorado wins this thing in five. Yeah, and uh, let, let, let's not forget um, that what that Vassy, he's you, you never you can never predict uh, what what he's going to do, and. Uh, Borkowski, who he's day to day as well. He could very well play in in game four as well. And I still think uh, Darcy Kemper uh, starts game game four. But does he finish it? We'll see. We'll definitely see. So, yeah, yeah. But Jacob, I want to thank you for joining me on this uh, Wine and Wednesday edition of the show. Tell everybody where they can find you online. Yes, sir. Um, um, you can find me on Twitter at Jacob Winans Eight. And you can find me on pantherparkway.com. My work is there and uh, got some some pretty interesting ideas and some things planned coming up for the off season as we get closer to draft and free agency. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Awesome. Thank you so much as always. Thanks for having me. And if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the podcast to be notified every single time the Lockdown Florida Panthers podcast jumps into your podcast feed. Don't forget to also subscribe to Locked On NHL and the Crosscheck NHL show with Andrew Berkshire and Mary Clark will be covering all the postseason activities around the National Hockey League. Thank you for making the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast your first listen of the day. And for your second listen of the day, make sure to listen to today's episode of Locked On NHL. Locked On NHL covers the playoffs like no other. Hear the latest news and opinions from local experts every Monday through Friday. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Sorry, Armando Velez. With Jacob Winans, and you've been listening to the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. <laughs>